something bad happens and we want to pinpoint that protagonist and say, okay, we're done. Everything is solved. But the truth is more often than not, ethical mishaps, they're more gray, they're more nuanced. And a lot of times it's an interaction between the person and the situation they're in. Welcome to the Self-Leadership Experiment, where we take an evidence-based perspective on all things organizational behavior. My name is Scott Dust. I'm a management professor, as well as a team member for an HR tech company. I'll be talking with my co-host, Louis DiCarlo, and we'll break down what's real and what's not, and what works and what doesn't work. Thanks for joining the conversation. Topic of the day, bad apples or bad barrels. So in this context of ethics, a lot of times something bad happens and we like to, in the organization say, well, that's the person that did it. That's the villain. And we want to pinpoint that protagonist and say, okay, we're done. Everything is solved. And sure, there's a lot of circumstances where someone purposefully or knowingly broke the law or intentionally took advantage of the system. But the truth is more often than not, ethical mishaps, they're more gray, they're more nuanced. And a lot of times it's an interaction between the person and the situation they're in. And so there's things we should be focusing on that are more at like the industry level and the culture and structure of the organization and the interpersonal dynamics, right? That are, that are broader and more abstract than just, you know, that person's a bad person. So I think we really need to reevaluate the system and think about the system, maybe even more so than, you know, we're just thinking about bad apples and bad actors. That's a good point. This, uh, this one's complex, I think. From a, from a high level when, when you think about it, but uh, bad apples, I mean, people are human, right? We're all going to make mistakes, but let's, let's walk it back, right? I think the organization or the team uh, is responsible for um, modeling good behavior, mm-hmm. modeling good ethics, yeah. educating people on what is expected. Mm-hmm. A lot of this might be general um, knowledge that everyone is aware of, but there's a lot of things that there's some fine gray lines, right? And I think it's up to the organization to uh, communicate that, model that, and, and teach people that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that what, like, what is the organizational role? I love the terminology used of, um, of role modeling. There's something called social learning theory that essentially says as higher ups engage in certain behaviors, especially when it's ethically related, it tends to trickle down from layer to layer. And it makes sense, right? We look up to our superiors. I'm saying that with air quotes in that those that are higher up in the organizational structure, we know that they have our, they have a sense of responsibility and power and authority over our positions. And so we look to them for signals. And so what they do eventually is going to cascade downward. Um, And then also part of that organizational system, like sometimes people are doing things that are unethical because in a way it actually is helping the organization. And so they're being given some signal or there's some culture that is essentially facilitating it or saying it's okay. So actually there's two different types of organizational uh, behavior concepts about ethics. There's things that are just straight up unethical behavior, but then there's also pro-organizational unethical behavior. So the latter being specific to self-interests and, or excuse me, the former being about self-interest, but pro-organizational unethical behavior, the latter is more so about doing things that are actually going, that are unethical, but for the sake of the organization you work for, where, you know, well, then now what, right? Why are we doing this? Uh, Those are good points. Um, I think two things, right? From the self, uh, the the self example that you gave where where it's benefiting the the person, right? Yeah. I think the organization has to set the boundaries, but then hold everyone accountable. And it's almost like the team or the organization is number one, right? So anyone's deviation of right or wrong, there needs to be some level of accountability for that. And everyone no one is more important than the team. So, I mean, I think that's why yeah. you need to take that approach. And so oftentimes you, you see people who are very high performers. We see this in sports all the time. The leash for someone with a very high uh, performing at an extremely high level is much longer mm-hmm. than someone else, right? And I, and I think, okay, so that goes into your next point. 
but that's good for the organization, right? So we turn a blind eye, right, to, to, to some of those behaviors. But I think at the end of the day, that's, can't be doing that. Right. Yeah, m- probably one of my favorite examples recently on, on this whole phenomenon of like the self-interested actor versus the organizational facilitation of, of the bad behavior is the, the Wells Fargo example uh, where uh, the mantra of eight is great became known, meaning we would like every account to have, or every, um, every individual, individual to have eight potential accounts with us, right? So they started being incentivized essentially through this cultural norm and this whole idea of upselling and cross-selling to the point where they, people were literally just opening up accounts that people didn't ask for. Um, and of course it's more gray than that, right? Like they were asking questions in a way to make it sound like, you know, this kind of might be an account, but kind of not, but people were taking liberties and engaging in this type of behavior, partly because they were being pushed down from above to do things that were almost impossible. And um, so we can't ever only fault the individual, right? And yes, we have to make sure that they are reprimanded and that they, that behavior is corrected and that justice is served. But we also, a lot of times are seeing that it's the organization, it's the, it's the leadership, it's the teams, it's that environment that it's really hard to put the shackles on that because that is such a, an ambiguous, you know, it's a, it's a network structure of individuals and policies and procedures. So more atten- the more attention we can pay, the more attention we can pay to the system as well as the individual, the better. But it's not. I think it's, I think it's a two way street and there's equal accountability yeah. on both sides. Right. The organization and its leaders and decision makers need to be setting an example. They need to be role modeling. And just as importantly, when when any team member crosses the line of ethics, there needs to be a level of accountability so that anyone uh um, down the road or, or, or the next person to, to, to cross that line, they already know what their um, consequence is because that, that's already been set. And I think that's what's important is consistency, um, accountability, and just an understanding of what, you're, what is to be expected. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and it's a short-term versus long-term thing, right? Like I think it's all said and done, a lot of people want to cut those corners, whether it's individuals or organizations, but it, it inevitably will rear its ugly head eventually, maybe not right away, but down the road. All right. Very good. So thanks for joining. For more resources on bridging the gap between science and practice for all things organizational behavior, head over to scottdust.com and sign up for the monthly email newsletter, as well as find additional evidence-based insight through podcasts, YouTube, and social media. Thanks.